Praise the Lord. Wow, how many people sense his presence today? It's a beautiful thing. If you're online, I pray that you are sensing God's goodness and his presence in your life right now. And uh, Amy and Daniel, thank you for leading us in worship this morning. Would you give them a, a hand this morning? Just beautiful. I'm also going to invite Caitlin to come on up here. And uh, Caitlin's our youth director, and uh, she's got a few words. I just wanted her to share and say hello. And everybody say, hey, Caitlin, go ahead. <laughs> Um, yeah, just something brief. Um, so I've been with the youth this summer, and oh, sorry, my breath. Um, we have two weeks left together, um, which is sad, but I'm excited. We've been um, doing a series right now on courage, and um, it's always interesting when I choose a series for teenagers because I think it's important for them to hear a message. And then as an adult, I'm like, wow, like I should be learning that too. So. Um, I guess I just wanted to encourage you guys today um, in being bold and being courageous. Um, that's something we've been really talking about and how our courage, um, often we can diminish it because we compare it to what someone else might be doing that is brave for them. But what is brave for us um, and what we need Jesus' help with to be brave for is often different than our neighbor. And so I just want to encourage you, whatever you're struggling with, to um, face with courage, um, to not compare or diminish the fact that you need courage for that thing, but to seek encouragement from Jesus, because he is our strength, he is our provider of courage. Um, yeah, so I just want to share that with you guys this morning. It's something that we're going through with the youth, and we've been talking about a lot, just reflecting on how in our lives can we be brave? How in our lives can we ask God for more courage? Um, so I just wanted to encourage you guys in that this morning as well. And, um, yeah, it's been an amazing summer. Uh, you have an amazing group of young people at this church, and I've really, it's just been such an honor to get to know them, to spend time with them. And um, just the Holy Spirit has taught me so much this summer through what I've felt called to teach the youth, and I've just been so grateful for um, the time that we've spent together. So, yeah, that's all I had to say this morning. Yeah. That's perfect. Thank you, Caitlin. Actually, uh, the young people are going to be missing her for sure. Um, when Jason was leading the youth, we, you know, right in the middle of the pandemic, we tried to figure out what we're going to do, and then we were blessed as Jason Herb came in and goes, I know exactly who should follow behind me. And like without a glitch, Caitlin jumped in there actually even ahead of time working and assisting with Jason, and I know Jason's watching uh, online sometimes, and so we just give him props for that. And then Caitlin, thank you for jumping in in a season uh, that you did. And uh, Ben, thank you for letting Caitlin, you guys moved to Straffer, right? So there's been a lot going on in your world, and, and, and still is, and, and, and uh, anyways, that's all I'll say today. But uh, you guys are awesome, and we were really grateful for you serving uh, our young people. And uh, I'm sure you're still praying what God's going to do next for us, and I'm inviting all of, us, all of the church to encourage you to pray for what's next for our, for our young people. They're not the church of tomorrow, they are the church of today, and we are excited about what God's doing with our teenagers. So will you make a commitment in praying for our young people and the leadership that's coming? Just uh, two of us, thank you. Okay, that's two or three, that's all I need is two or three. Okay, there's more, thank you. Um, but would you give Caitlin a hand this morning, thanking her for... <laughs> wonderful. If you're online, there's a big applause for our dear sister. That's wonderful. If you could take your Bibles today, we're going to jump into the Word of God. I have a full message today. Uh, going to be more teachy than preachy, but you know me. I have no idea where it's going to go. Um, but I want to look at the prayer of David. And we've been walking through a series called Prevail, Prevailing Prayers, uh, learning from these great prayers that are in Scripture about God has a plan for us, and His plan gets unraveled and unfurled, so to speak, like a flag waving in our lives. That we've been, oh, there, there's God, is that when we're in prayer, we see the plans of God being manifest in our lives. David's prayer is powerful. We're going to look at 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 9 to 20. Rather than reading it up front, I'm going to actually uh, read it as we go. But let me just give you a little introduction before we begin reading Scripture. 
I want you to just turn your Bibles to 1 Chronicles 29, and uh, you'll have your place there. That's great. Prayer isn't just asking God for favors. It's not asking God for authorization or permission. Prayer isn't asking God for forgiveness, although many of those things could be involved in your prayer life. Uh, it's much more than that. It's a, prayer really is a great spirit-inspired relational experience where the Spirit of the Lord and your heart collide. And if the book of Psalms is any indication, and you probably wonder why I'm not in the book of Psalms, which is one of my favorite books of the Bible, which many of you have commented on, because I reference every sermon probably with at least one reference from Psalms, uh, is that we're actually going to find a psalm in Chronicles uh, that wasn't included in, in the book of Psalms, which is a beautiful thing. But David's prayers throughout all the book of Psalms and most of Psalms, it's an indication of prayer and praise being united together. Today, we had a wonderful experience of worship and praise, and I think it's perfectly timed that today's message works along with the great sense of God wanting us to worship Him and to praise Him and let that be part of our prayer lives. Amen and amen. Acts chapter 2, verse 11, you don't have to turn there, but it says they were declaring the wonders of God in their own tongues, in their own language, in their own styles, in their own flavors. Their praise to God was demonstrated when the Spirit of the Lord captured the heart of that early church. And that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. And they gathered with the purpose to pray, but it ended up praise was on their lips as a result of that prayer time. Let me ask you a question before we even go any further. Does your prayer life encourage you to praise God? Or does it kind of just feel like a checklist at a grocery store where you have a shopping list, done, 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 God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, need it, and then you're done? Or do you feel like praising God? God at the end of it. The book of Psalms talks about many times uh, the wonders, the wonderful works of God, the deeds of his power, translated maglios, magnificent praise to our God, and his greatness, his mighty deeds, all these things that call us as people of God to extol his greatness, to tell him how worthy he is, how wonderful he is, worshiping God in his greatness and in his glory and in his splendor. And that's a result of a, of a prayer life. David's prayer, prayer life in spe specifically will encourage us in that. You ever heard the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness? Kind of a, I don't know, it's, it's common, maybe, yeah, you know that one. But how many people, you, when you begin to sing that song, the first thing you do is your eyes go to the heavens and you're declaring who he is. It's a worship song that's not about you, it's about him. I think our prayer lives a lot reflect who we are as opposed to reflecting what God is and who God is in our midst. Great is thy faithfulness, O God our Father. We worship the King. He's glorious. He's high. How many people know the beautiful song, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty? Come on. Is there ever a worship song that isn't as much of a prayer? Like, it's all about Him. It's beautiful. Would you agree? Some of our modern praise choruses, right? They lead us into praise and they lead us into worship. Um, but, the, you know, but dear friends, I, sometimes I think the practice of, of just singing about ourselves really doesn't really fulfill all that God wants in our lives, but we really need to focus on our God in our personal quiet time in our prayer life. It needs to be filled with praise. Would, would everybody just do me a favor? You don't, just do it for me. You don't feel like doing it. I already, some of you don't want to do this, but can you please just have a little sympathy for your pastor and today? Oh, I feel sorry for him. I'm going to do what he's asking. Could you just give a great big praise the Lord on a count of three? One, two, three. Pray. Praise the Lord. Okay, wow, thank you. I feel much better. That was really encouraging. Thank you. Wonderful. God is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Let me set the scene for 1 Corinthians. So chapter 28 and chapter 29 are basically the end of the days of David's life. This prayer in Chronicles is basically, it is his last prayer, and it's almost like, not a deathbed prayer, but it's his, the last prayer testament the last words from his heart about extolling his god and how great our god is and so we see this elderly king 
And he stands in the frailty of his being at the end of his days to address the people of that time. And he leads them in this powerful prayer. And as he's doing that, he also uh, prays for, he presents to Solomon in that prayer gifts from his belongings. And he encourages the people of that time to give to the temple that Solomon, David wanted to build it. But how many people know sometimes the dreams and the visions of your heart get fulfilled in the next generation? That's actually a whole sermon right there. True? David needed Solomon. Would you agree with me on that? And Solomon was there and took what the people brought together and he built a glorious temple. And David's prayer, the end result is the people respond with great generosity, not only of praise, but in their giving. So let me just look at verse 9. We'll start right there. Uh, This is really about giving toward the future temple. And here's the response of the people. David's leading them. He gives this introduction. Then it says, The people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders. So leaders led. They were first in this. They were the first to respond. The people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, for they, the leaders, had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly when he saw this tremendous response from the leaders. Can I tell you, leaders have to lead. Leaders have to be the ones that lead in prayer, lead in praise, lead in worship, lead in evangelism. Leaders of this church, listen to me very carefully. I'm preaching a mini little sermon to you. Lead. In Jesus' name, in all the areas of your life. And all the people said amen to that little mini-sermon. The common people were moved by the leaders. They were moved to praise the Lord when they saw those around them that were leading them with their great, generous dedication of wealth to the building of the future of the kingdom of God in their midst. This verse carries two powerful ideas, two significant words of praise that I want to highlight. And the first one is rejoice. The people rejoiced. And that word is sama. It denotes being glad, joyful with their whole disposition. So another part, in other words, it's not just a smile on their face and you know, grumpy inside. Their whole disposition was glad. Can you tell a person when they're faking being happy? These people were not faking it. Every part of them rejoiced. So you could feel the joy in their being. How many people know with skipping the step, you could tell that person's got something going on that's pretty happy on the inside, right? You ever see, how about this? I'm so happy, praise the Lord. How many people know that doesn't really reflect what's going on inside? Would you agree? Head down, mopey, mopey. No, no, no. These people completely rejoiced. Spirit, soul, and body. I'm sure there was a shout and a joy going out of that place that was absolutely wonderful. They responded to the generous and godly behavior of their leaders. And their ge- can I tell you, your generosity touches other people. Somebody gave a wonderful donation last week to the Benevolent Fund. And you know, my heart rejoiced. What? Well, that's so great. It actually is going to be a blessing to so many people. And I said, praise the Lord for that. You might, I'm not going to center that. I don't actually know who, who made that offering. But my heart rejoiced. I said, this is wonderful. Your generosity can cause people to rejoice. Is that great? And it's not just about giving of finances. It's your generosity of love, your generosity of joy. Did you know joy is contagious? You ever stand in an elevator, and what's the worst thing to do? Start look, looking at people in the elevator, right? That's the weird. How many people know that's weird? <laughs> Isn't it funny how you step into an elevator and everybody does the same thing? I have a little assignment. You ever step into an elevator and COVID's over? Just smile and see what people do. Freak them out. Make them wonder what you're up to. <laughs> Your generosity of joy will touch people. Here's another word here is willing and free. In verse 9, willing and freely. In both the translations, uh, it says the word nadab. They're kind of joined together, which connotes an uncompelled and free movement of will towards divine sacrifice, 
divine service. So there was more than just the emotion of the moment. It compelled them to engage willingly and freely to serve the Lord. Hallelujah. That's what praise does for you. Praise is contagious. Praise makes you want to serve the Lord. Praise makes you want to smile. Praise wants you. And if your prayer life is filled with praise, people are going to notice. Remember in the book of Acts? Those people look like they've been with Jesus. What do you think that looked like? Do you think there was something visible going on in their lives that made those even unbelievers notice that they had been with Jesus? Absolutely. Let me look at uh, 9 verse 7 of 2 Corinthians. And I just want to put this on the screen. And it's equivalent here of what happened in 1 Chronicles. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly. Everybody say, not reluctantly. And that, that, could be, that, that could be described so many different ways. Or under compulsion. You ever felt like you had to give because you felt guilted into giving before? Or you felt, you know, I'm going to say even abused in giving? I don't know if you ever felt so, like, manipulated, like, oh, and, oh, it's embarrassing. I remember in church, I'm not going to go into details, but if you didn't come to the altar with some money in the envelope, you felt like you, everybody was staring at you. It was like, a, it was a terrible experience, I felt under compulsion. And I think that was a terrible manipulation. And that has happened in churches and psh, 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 slap the ministries that have made that their lifestyle. By the way, if you see a minister on TV and says, if you don't give your next nickel, we're going under. Let them go, let them go, just let them go. If they need your nickel and they're going to go under, then smooth sailing, bye-bye. I don't know. If I ever do that, please come up, somebody slap me and say, remember that sermon you preached in August 2021? Anyways, it goes on here, under compulsion, for God loves, finish this with me, for God loves a cheerful giver. He'll take it from a grouch, but he loves a cheerful giver. But notice here, David himself, back in, in First Chronicles, he set the example of giving and inspired the followers with selfless attitude to respond we leaders and those of us who want to lead in the house of the Lord, we need to lead and rededicate ourselves, our finances, our prayer life, our commitment and praise to the Lord, because giving is as spiritual as it gets. Tithing, offerings, is as spiritual as It's at the roots of our faith. You can't separate, oh, I ain't going to that church. They talk about finances. Well, every day the world talks about finances. Hello? How many people know we live in a world that talks about finances all the time? Just go to the grocery store and walk out without paying. See what happens. <laughs> hello, true? If you don't pay your rent, how long are you going to stay there? Not very long. What about utilities? You, oh, you're in the dark. If you don't pay your bills, the whole world, re come on. And we're not supposed to talk about finances in church? It's a part of life. And how many people would agree? Go ahead, pastor, you can keep on preaching. All right. Verse 10, let's move right along. Some of you get nervous. I can see it through your eyes, even though your mask is hiding it. Verse 10, David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our Father Israel. This is beautiful. God of our Father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. So praise to Yahweh. There's important verbs in this verse uh, that I'm just going to pull out. Leave it on the screen. Uh, a word to bless the Lord is Barak, um, verse 10, and also in verse 20 in the same text, means to bless. So our praise and our prayer life is to bless God. And then there's the word yada. I won't go into it right now, but yada is, is I love that word yada. Everyone goes yada, yada, yada. It means give thanks, give thanks, give thanks. And it's a great word, but that's wrapped up into this verse as well. And also halal, which is a praise. It's a boast. It's a declaration. Basically, when we say hallelujah, we're saying we're proud of praising our God. Hallelujah. This is a good thing. And that's found in verse 13 of this entire text. But I won't go into the details of those two. But let me talk to you about Barak for a moment here. We'll examine the other two later, but this word Barak is praised, blessed, to bless, to endue with power. Does God need our power? No, absolutely not. But when we're blessing the Lord, when we're praising our God, when we lift our holy hands, when we declare, Lord, we want to bless you, we want to magnify you, we're saying, God, you are worthy 
of all blessing to your name. We look in the Old Testament many times over. Abraham blessed the Lord. Jacob blessed the Lord. Jesus, when he laid hands on the children, this word barak comes up, a blessing was imparted, was endued. It wasn't just, a, oh, nice little kids, there you go, Lord bless you. Something transferred from Jesus into those children's lives. There was an impartation. Blessing is about impartation. Hallelujah, it's a good thing. Leviticus 9, verse 22 talks about Aaron blessing the Lord. It's incredible. You look at Jesus himself when his prayer life, in fact, Luke 24, verse 50, it talks about when he was in prayer, he lifted his hands to the Father. He declared blessing to God. It's incredible. So if Jesus did it, how many people think that we're following Jesus? We probably should be people that bless the Lord. Would you agree? So we give him praise. Sometimes we wait for the praise for Sunday morning. Can I tell you, let's not be Sunday morning praisers. Let's be everyday Praisers. Let's wake up in the morning and say, praise the Lord. Lord, today I want to bless you. My life is going to bless you. I'm going to live a life that gives you honor and glory and bless you, Lord. It's a good day to praise the Lord. I think there's a lot of people that need that kind of joy in their prayer life. You go ahead and point your finger at yourself. That's okay. It's, it's all right. That's, that's good. Also, we have this word bless in the word in the Latin, which is benedictus, which is where we get our benediction at the end of each service, where we give a benediction. It basically, it's a blessing upon the people to serve the Lord. It's a beautiful thing. So David praised publicly. What, what I mean by that is blessing the Lord isn't something that's just private. It must be demonstrated or declared from your lives so that we can also teach others how to praise how many people you ever feel grumpy or you feel down and feel low and you still come to church anybody ever done that before i do it yeah i'm a pastor i sometimes not feel 100 percent. and you know what when you begin to bless the lord with me it change something happens i need you to bless the lord the person beside you needs them needs you to bless the Lord. We need each other to bless the Lord. It's a beautiful thing. Publicly de giving God praise. Look at verse 10, the part of it at, at there. At, praise be to you, O Lord. Everybody say, O Lord. O Lord. God of our Father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. In other words, this doesn't stop. We're going to praise. This kind of praise doesn't stop. Let me talk to you now about verse 11, power and glory. So we look at here, it begins to describe the attributes uh, of God through various qualities of might and strength and glory. He says, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. How many people get the point here? He could go on and on and on to declare how great his God is. Can you imagine if your prayer life was, you began and all you did was declare all the good things that you can think about God? Wouldn't that be a powerful time? That's what's happening here in David's prayer is that from the very beginning of this prayer, he's continually adding these praises to God for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Let me just real quickly go through these ideas. Greatness is a root word that expresses physical growth as well as increase. He's massive. He's magnificent. Power is all from the root word garuba, which means associated with warfare, that he's stronger than anything or anyone. He's so strong and mighty. He's a mighty warrior par excellence. He's above it all. There is no rival like we sang today. Amen? Some people say, well, there's God and the devil is the opposite. No, the devil's not even close to being the opposite of God. He's a fallen angel. There's no one like our God. He's high above all. There's no one that can compare. In the name of our great and mighty God, nothing comes close to how amazing he is. And then he glory talks about beauty and wonder and majesty. The word majesty itself there talks about the victory of God. Strength and victory belong to our God. Brilliance and endurance, it can go on and on. So even though there are these words in this prayer, each one of them has multiple words that describe these specific words. Splendor as well looks at majesty. Uniquely a Hebrew word that, that leaves you with awe. When you talk about the splendor of our God, 
Uh, when was the last time your prayer time just went, oh, God, you're so awesome? My God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven up. You know that song? I think we don't realize how powerful worship like that is. Psalm 22, verse 3, talks about this. You are holy. You inhabit the praises of God's people. I'll put God's people there. Let's read that with me. But you are holy. You inhabit the praises of Israel. So God dwells and lives in the praises of his people. He inhabits. He enthrones himself. He sits there. He dwells with those who pray. You want God to visit Bethany Church? Let's be a praising church. Let's bless his holy name and watch the presence of the living God come and leave us with a sense of awe and a love and, and marvel of his wonders and glory. Oh, hallelujah. How many people remember those camp meeting days? I don't know about you, but you just singing songs. And they were like ditties, to be honest with you. You're singing like the same song like 400 times, right? You know those songs? I don't know if you but were raising those. Anybody ever go to this camp, sawdust trail? where the whole sawdust was, the altar was covered with sawdust, you fall down on the power of the Spirit, and you look like you're working in the barn all day. <laughs> those songs, we say, hallelujah. We sang it eight times, and then we sang those eight hallelujahs 800 times. Like one word. And the glory and the majesty of his presence. How many people long for a visit of God's presence to come? He inhabits he lives in your praise. So if you're feeling far from God in your prayer life, you know what? Sometimes it's really hard to pray. You ever find that your prayer life is hard sometimes just to find words because you're just like not in the mood? It's just me? Okay. Anybody else? No? My wife. Okay, thank you, honey. Just Oh, and Andy. Thank you, Andy. So just Andy and I and Sonia have struck. Pray for us. But sometimes we don't always feel God. And, but you know what we need to do? Just worship just praise. Turn your prayer meeting into a praise meeting and watch what God does. And then it goes on. It says, thine is the kingdom and the power. Verse uh, 29, verse 11b. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You were exalted as head over all. It's significant for David here because he's a king, right? And so he recognizes that there's a greater king because God is the king of kings. Jesus is the king of kings. So he acknowledges that the kingdom of God belongs to God. Many monarchs would not be like David. They'd be threatened by anybody. Come on, even Caesar was threatened by people saying Jesus was Lord, right? That's what got early Christians killed when they just said Jesus is Lord because Caesar wanted to be Lord, right? The world is threatened by people who believe in a kingdom that's greater than the kingdoms of this earth. How many people know our kingdom is amazing that we're a part of? It's so magnificent. We're a part of a great kingdom because we have a great king. Hallelujah. Kingdom, the means that he rules as king, that he is truly not just Lord in theory, but he's our functional Lord or functional king, and we are his subjects, and he has a right to rule us. He has a right to direct us. He has a right to tell us what to do. King Jesus can tell me what to do anytime. Hallelujah. Oh my goodness, there's so much here. I can't even unpack this properly because I'm just, maybe this needs to be like a three, five part, part series. I have no idea, but I just really want to how many people get the point of what I'm trying to do here? I don't know if I'm excited enough or not. The Lord's Prayer. The doxology of the Lord's Prayer. Do you see it here? For you, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In fact, look at 1 Chronicles 29, 11, the whole thing together. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Let me just talk about head over all just for a brief moment here. We see this as a really, not just a poetic statement that God is somehow the head, and we get a picture or an image of a body. Can I tell you it's not that, because he's way above our body. So it's not just like, oh, God's here, and we're here, and we're the body of Christ, but he's the head. Uh, it's actually far above, a head over all. It's um, Hebrew poetry, and in this psalm, uh, th this is a poem that doesn't rhyme. Does that bother you when you read a poem and it doesn't rhyme, or do you think it's profound then? How You ever read a poem, you don't understand it, and go, man, that must be deep. 
So basically, Yahweh is king, is pretty clear, and refers to the head here, meaning chief of the family. So it's an interesting one word describes the fact that he's the chief or the, the ruler of the family of God. I love how God pictures himself, that he's not just a monarch, but he's the head of the family. He's above all of us, but he looks all of us as family, not as peasants, not as a king would look at the, you know, citizens. Sonia worked in the acting industry, as you know, and one time she met one of these famous actors. I won't tell you uh, exactly who it is because I don't want to put them down, but uh, they called the people who were not celebrities citizens. That's it. So, oh, the citizens are here. It's like, wow, really? How many people think they had a little bit of a pride issue? But how many people know our God doesn't look at us as just mere peasants or citizens? He looks at us as sons and daughters of the great family of God. Isn't that a beautiful picture? That's what that actually means. And then it talks about here him being the exalted one in the, in the last half of this verse. And David speaks of exalted um, naza. It's a word that's so beautiful. It means to lift up, to bear his name, to carry, to support, and elevate to exalt our great God. The Song of Moses and Miriam, these are some other places where it says in Scripture about exalt. Uh, Exodus 15, it goes, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. He is my God. I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. That's what Moses and Miriam were declaring. There's another, Nehemiah says this, Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. Glorify the Lord with me, David, says in another text. Let us exalt his name together. Psalm 118 says, You are my God, I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. See all these great references in Scripture about lifting up his name. What if your prayer life was all about, it? I exalt thee, I exalt thee. For thou, O Lord, art high above the earth. Peter Sanchez pulled right out of Psalm 97. Thou art exalted far above all gods, little g gods. We know the rest of the song. Look how it just goes, I exalt thee, I exalt thee, I exalt thee. How many people know he titled that song really well? (laughs) I exalt thee, I exalt thee, I exalt thee, I exalt thee. What if our prayer life was just, I exalt thee? Do you think that would change your prayer life? Let me go on. Uh, there's so much more, sorry, but I'm, I'm going to go quickly. This is like a reader's digest now. I feel like I'm going way too fast. Wealth and honor from Yahweh. This is 29 verse 12. Talks about how God deserves all the blessing. We talked about the giving and wealth and honor and praise be unto his name. Um, Revelation talks about it as, as well. The book of Revelation Uh, Chapter 4, verse 8. Holy, holy, holy is Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and is to come. Verse 11 of the same chapter. You're worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created. Look at chapter 5 of Revelation 13. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Would you read this with me? Be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Let's give him more praise. Let's be people of praise. Let our prayer life be marked with praise. 29 of First Chronicles 13. Now our God, we give you thanks. Here's where yada is. Now God, we give you yada. And praise. That's the word halal. To your glorious name. Giving thanks. To acknowledge and confess how grateful we are. I think what praise does, it makes us grateful. And it should be, our, our praise should be filled with thankfulness. Yada, 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 yada to our God. And then praise is to boast, as I mentioned earlier, to extol the superior God of the heavens. And you think of us. Who are we that God of all creation would consider us? It's a beautiful thing. There's an old hymn, I'm going to jump to this older hymn, move along here, uh, by William W. Howe. He 
says it well. We give thee. Here's, here's the first one is I exalt thee. Here's the song called We Give Thee. So how many people know these, these guys understand some things here? We give thee but thine own, whatever the gift may be. And all that we have is thine alone. I trust, O Lord, from thee. This is what happens when everything, it says in, in, in 1 Chronicles 29, 14 to 16, basically it wraps up with this, everything comes from God. Everything is a blessing that comes from God. And then in verse 17 of Chronicles, I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. All these things have I willingly and with honest intent. I've given willingly and with honest intent. And now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. Again, it comes back to sacrifice of giving whatever we can to the Lord. And then he ends with this, and I think this is so appropriate for Bethany. He prays for Solomon, his son, and the generations to come, for the sons and daughters that are coming. And Bethany, if you ever want to be in prayer, and Caitlin, I'm glad you were here in our service today as a representative of the young generation that's in our midst, which is our prized possession, folks. They're the treasure of this church. And Andrea, when she begins, and in, in pray for her as we begin children's ministry. Come on now, can you believe that we're getting out of this thing? We're going to have kids again in the building in, in September when we go back to church and children are once again here. Can I tell you, they're never an inconvenience. They're what we do. This is why we're here, to lead the next generation. Come on, Bethany's one generation away from extinction if otherwise. We want the young people to rise up and take their place. We want the children to rise up. And there's no junior Holy Spirit, right? They're not like a half pint, you know, filled with God. Their little bodies can't handle all of God. Come on, they, some of them, sometimes their praise is going to lead us. Glory to God. Wouldn't that be exciting? Woo! There are the kids up here doing their whatever. Maybe not rap. I'm not so sure about that. But anyways, I'm getting old too. But can you imagine, he wraps up this prayer. People of God, here's my son Solomon. In verse 18 to 19, O Lord, God of our fathers, listen to this, he, he identifies with the generations that have come before him. O Lord, God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and that's wonderful. We need to honor the generations that have come before us. Keep this desire in the hearts of your people forever and keep their hearts loyal to you. And give my sons and daughters, I'm going to just add that there, that's my paraphrase, your, my son Solomon, wholehearted devotion to keep your commands, to requirements and decrees, to do everything to build up the palatial structure which I have provided. In other words, he was building something that wasn't ever going to be inhabited by him. He's building for the future. Isn't this a beautiful thing? And just like at the very beginning of this psalm, it starts with praise, it ends with praise and worship. Verse 20, he recognizes it's the, the young generation that's coming that needs the greatest support. And then he says, verse 20, then David said to the whole assembly, praise the Lord your God. So they all praised the Lord, the God of their fathers. They bowed low and fell prostrate. Oh, sorry, that'd be prostrate. Oh, you can worship God with your heart. I guess you can worship God with other organs too. But anyway, that's another. They bowed low and fell prostrate before the Lord and the king. They humbled themselves and gave more thanks. 